delivery to Fisk. He swings, long drive, left field. If it stays there, it's gone. Home run! The Red Sox win! And the series is tied three games apiece. It's This Week in Baseball's Greatest Plays. All of the best plays in baseball can be yours with this action-packed video. Go around the horn in style, making a special stop in the Wizards' world. Swing, a one-hop shot, diving play by Ozzie. Long throw, you wouldn't believe it. To be a good fielder, you have to develop the ability to improvise. Ozzie from the outfield grass. Oh, is he sweet or what? Some of these plays are so incredible, you'll have to hit rewind and watch them again and again. To order for just $19.95, call 1-800-524-1122. This Week in Baseball's Greatest Plays. You'll see the great Johnny Bench, whose cannon arm intimidated opponents as he revolutionized the position. You'll see other notorious masked men, like the Iron Wall, Mike Sosha. I have never in my life seen a catcher block home plate like Mike Sosha. Call 1-800-524-1122. You'll get a bona fide bonanza. Bo Jackson on the run. Makes a diving catch, a tremendous play by Bo Jackson. I've known this guy for 26 years, and uh, nothing he does pays me. Ball on the charge. Ball is there. Bo's not the only one who knows great action. You'll see many high wire acts, including some daredevils who laugh in the face of danger. Get it all on This Week in Baseball's Greatest Plays. Call 1-800-524-1122. That's 1-800-524-1122. Visa and MasterCard only. New York City, October 16, 1969. All eyes and ears were tuned to Shea Stadium, where even the most ardent fans were amazed. The Miracle Mets upset the Baltimore Orioles in five games to become champions of the world. A fairy tale climax to one decade of baseball and a stirring prelude to the great decade of transition soon to come. October 17, 1979. The Pittsburgh Pirates come back from a three game to one deficit to defeat the Baltimore Orioles. Pittsburgh's triumph sets the stage for a new era while providing a dramatic conclusion to one of baseball's most historic decades. A decade of transition. Major League Baseball Productions presents Baseball in the 70s. 1969, remembered as the year in which man paraded on the moon and the New York Mets defied gravity to win the World Series. That same season, Major League Baseball also took one giant step toward a new decade by introducing divisional play. In the National League, the Eastern Division champion Mets took on the Western Division Atlanta Braves and thrilled record crowds by winning three straight in the championship series. Throughout the following decade, the championship series proved highly successful, often more dramatic than even the World Series. Like Kansas City in the American League, the Philadelphia Phillies found the pressure excruciating, losing pennants three years in a row, twice to the Los Angeles Dodgers. Without a doubt, divisional play brought added excitement to a sport growing by leaps and bounds in a decade of transition. In the 1960s, the expansion Houston Astros had built a ballpark designed for the future, the Astrodome, complete with air conditioning and flashy electronic scoreboards. The 1970s brought more expansion, more scoreboards, and more baseball to fans everywhere. 
baseball blossomed in areas like San Diego and returned to others like Milwaukee. Teams, young and old, broke new grounds, building new homes for a grand old game. The 70s saw new ballparks built in Cincinnati, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Kansas City. And new parks meant new fans for the future. And talk about futurism, how about Olympic Stadium in Montreal? Expansion came again to Canada in 1977, where opening day at Exhibition Stadium in Toronto found the Blue Jays playing their first game ever in a spring snowstorm. That same year, below the snow-capped peaks of Mount Rainier, the expansion Seattle Mariners opened under the Kingdom. Visiting players had to adjust to the King Dome's quirks, just as they might to a Fenway Park or a Wrigley Field. It was exciting baseball spreading to more fans, displaying more enthusiasm than ever before. The 1970s saw clubs reach season attendance goals never before imagined. Three million hometown fans watched the Dodgers in 78, an average turnout of almost 42,000. In the last four years of the decade, baseball's overall attendance figures skyrocketed from 29 to 43 million. The 1970s, a history-making decade and a decade of significant changes. The first World Series game under the lights played at Pittsburgh's Three Rivers Stadium. The Pirates, who during the year became the first team to start nine blacks, won a thriller from Baltimore four to three, and millions across the country got to see it on primetime television. Four years later, under a full moon at Fenway Park, the whole country stayed up past midnight to see possibly the most exciting World Series game ever played. Boston's Carlton Fisk climaxed game six against Cincinnati with this 12th inning homer. Perhaps not coincidentally, baseball signed a new national television contract the same year, one that now involved two major networks. Another innovation of this decade of transition was introduced by the American League in 1973. The Yankees' Ron Bloomberg became the first designated hitter. Others included Orlando Cepeda of the Red Sox, Tommy Davis of the Orioles, and Tony Oliva of the Twins. That year, Oliva, after four knee operations, batted 291 with 92 RBIs. Without the new DH rule, he could not have played. Still, the National League was not interested. The hitter? The hitter? Designated hitter. Oh, I said we don't like the designated hitter. Or runner? No. You're going to adopt the hitter pretty soon. No, we won't. Have to. No, we won't. Works too well. No, it doesn't. Does too. Look we at our league. We don't need fly. What did it work? It worked all over. Today, it works for players like Willie Horton, who might not even start in the National League, but who had quite a year in 79 just swinging the bat for Seattle. Detractors of the DH say it ruins the nuances of managerial strategy. Supporters say it keeps old favorites like Horton in the game. Should anyone forget, Hank Aaron concluded his career as DH for Milwaukee. Of course, that was after he struck the most historic blow of the decade, career home run number 715. Breaking Babe Ruth's record just may have been sport's most impressive milestone. But the decade was full of events, full of happenings, and full of personalities. California's Nolan Ryan set the all-time season strikeout record, pitched four no-hitters, and three times in one season, fanned 19 while pitching for a last-place team. Roberto Clemente put on a World Series tour de force for Pittsburgh in 1971 and then went on to collect his 3,000th hit, the last hit of his career 
before his fatal plane crash on a mercy mission to Nicaragua. And then there's the ageless Father Time. Gaylord Perry was traded four times, but won 15 straight in 74, and in 78 became the first player to win Cy Young Awards in both the American and National Leagues, the latter coming at the age of 40. Cardinal speedster Lou Brock stole a record 118 bases in 1974 at age 35, then broke Ty Cobb's career mark before retiring in 79 with over 3,000 hits. Then there was the year of the bird. Detroit's Mark Fidrich was only a non-roster player in the spring of 76, but went on to win 19 games, attracting almost 900,000 fans. Perhaps no player in the history of the game ever turned on a crowd like the bird. Mike Marshall, kinesiologist and relief specialist, won the Cy Young Award with the Los Angeles in 1974, appearing in an unbelievable 106 games, including 13 straight. Baltimore's Brooks Robinson opened the decade with what may be the most dazzling one-man show in World Series history. The Houdini of the hot corner gave new meaning to the word defense. Pete Rose continued to excite fans throughout the 70s with his blood and gut style of play. And believe it or not, in one decade, Charlie Hustle had over 2,000 base hits. And finally, who can forget Reggie Jackson in the 77 World Series against the Dodgers? In one game, three swings, three home runs, and a record five for the series. Suddenly, the New York Yankees were world champs, just like the old days. In a decade of transition, these are only a few of many players who helped spur a new enthusiasm for the game of baseball. They were known as the Amazing A's, and more than any team in the 70s, they set the style for a new era of baseball. Or was it an old era of baseball? Mustachioed faces, handlebars not excluded, matched the rugged yet stylish image of players from a century ago. But these A's were more intent on making history than imitating it. Like no place else in sports, Oakland in the early 70s reflected the changing times. Colorful times demanded colorful uniforms, which spread everywhere. And orchestrating the wild concert of green and gold, Charlie O. Finley, cheerleader, owner, and chief decision maker on the field. You will definitely play. Let's let Charlie call and says I can. The A's may not have liked Charlie's backseat managing, but Finley had assembled a brilliant bunch of performers. When it came to winning ball games, they proved that the man knew his business. On the field, Oakland was the tightest team of the decade. They'd hustle out a win with a perfect double steal. Execute relays with deadly precision. Deliver the clutch blow in the late innings. And with the game on the line, someone was always there to make the big play. Of course, Finley's band of outsiders didn't always boast the best of manners. The A's played at being the bad guys as much as the good. In 1972, when they made their first World Series appearance against the Cincinnati Reds, the A's were minus Reggie Jackson and rated as real underdogs. Yet, Oakland toppled the big red machine in seven games with four one-run victories. Little did the baseball world know that Charlie Finley, Dick Williams, and company were on their way to becoming one of baseball history's greatest teams. In 1973, after trailing the Mets three games to two, the A's stormed back to win again. And with Raleigh Fingers earning a win and two saves in 74, 
The A's took Los Angeles in five games, three straight world titles, and yet Oakland only seemed to get better. But off the field, events were shaping up that would take the glitter out of the green and gold. Ace pitcher Catfish Hunter charged Finley with breach of contract. Arbitrator Peter Seitz declared Hunter a free agent. And Finley, the man who had urged big changes in baseball, now felt the force of the game's biggest change. In 75, Oakland lost to Boston in the championship series, and soon the once brilliant A's would be completely devastated. Reggie Jackson, too expensive in the light of free agency, was soon shipped to Baltimore. One by one, other key players followed. Joe Rudy, always so valuable in the clutch, went on to find new fortunes in Anaheim. Ace reliever Raleigh Fingers, who averaged 20 saves over six straight seasons, took the free agent route to San Diego. Captain Sal Bando offered his leadership and experience to Milwaukee. Shortstop Bert Campaneris, who led the league in steals six times with the A's, sold his services to Texas. And catcher Gene Tennis, the unlikely hero of Oakland's 72 upset over Cincinnati, joined Fingers at a hefty price tag in San Diego. And finally, Vita Blue, MVP and Cy Young winner in 71, became the last to leave after attempts by Finley to sell him to New York and Cincinnati were aborted by baseball's commissioner. Within four years, the glory of Oakland became a distant memory. Stocked with unproven youngsters, the club lost all sense of direction in its plunge to the cellar. The future? Well, Finley's resurfaced, and with him, a new manager. As how far we're gonna go, we don't know. But I know one thing, Billy Martin and Charlie Finley will give it hell to go as far as we can. The volatile Billy Martin is back in Oakland where he grew up. The A's are his fifth team and one that should give Billy the Kid quite a challenge in the 80s. Catfish Hunter had much to do with making the A's world champions and also much to do with making the 1970s the decade of transition. Signing with the Yankees for over $3 million in late 74 put a whole new price tag on the individual star. Earlier in 1970, Kurt Flood of the Cardinals had tried to test baseball's reserve clause by refusing to accept his trade to Philadelphia. The case went to court. Two years later, the Supreme Court, citing precedents in previous cases, upheld the reserve clause. Nevertheless, the 70s saw players make unprecedented gains. Ron Santo of the Cubs in 1973 became the first player to invoke the new 10-5 rule when he refused a trade to the Angels. He later accepted a trade to the White Sox. Then in 1975, Dave McNally played without a new contract and so did Andy Messersmith of the Dodgers. Both tested the reserve clause and arbitrator Peter Seitz declared them free agents free to sell their services to the teams of their choice. Suddenly, it was a whole new ball game for the players, for the fans, and for management. At the conclusion of the 76 season, baseball held its first re-entry draft for free agents, the result of which saw salaries soar. Many thought the players were asking for the moon, but more often than not, they got what they asked for, and then some. The following figures, taken from published reports, represent the yearly salaries before and after free agency.
Today, few teams can avoid dipping into the free agent market if they want to contend. Yet, even those teams who profited most worry where it's all headed. I feel that it's necessary on the part of baseball uh, at this point to really reassess our priorities. We've gone through, going into the 80s, we've been through a successful period, but a period that has seen costs skyrocket. And uh, as everybody knows, uh, you, baseball is still the best buy in professional sports, and I want to keep it that way. So in order to do that, I think we have to have some semblance of reasonableness in here, and that ownership must regain uh, a position where they can maintain the prices uh, for the fans, and at the same time be fair to the players. With management fighting to keep ticket prices down, and players looking to maximize their value, baseball entered the new decade with a strike threatening to delay the start of the season. As spring training drew to a close, the players then decided to boycott the last week of exhibition games, but start the 1980 season as scheduled while continuing negotiations with management until May 22nd. The principal point of contention is club compensation for loss of a free agent. Under the recently expired basic player agreement, a team that loses a free agent receives only a high school or college player from the amateur draft in return. The owners feel that this form of compensation is not appropriate in all cases. Management representative Ray Greeby explains the owner's position. We're saying for a ranking free agent, and clearly experienced dictates and indicates that there are differentiations between lower ranking middle and top ranking free agents for the ranking free agent the amateur draft choice plus a minor or a major league player who is not protected by a club uh, should be be available as a form of player selection rights the owners point to the pete rose case to support their proposal in 1978 rose played out his contract with cincinnati and signed with the philadelphia phillies in return, the Reds were awarded a number one draft choice and signed an 18-year-old high school player. The owners feel that an unproven amateur is not equitable compensation for baseball's player of the decade. Only time will tell how this issue will be resolved and what effect it will have on baseball in the 80s. Yankee Stadium, home of champions, was anything but when the New York Yankees opened the new decade. Manager Ralph Houck had seen the once mighty Bronx Bombers crumble to the status of also Rams. That is, until George Steinbrenner bought the club in 1973. It's important to me, it's important to all of us, and it's particularly important to New York and to the Yankees that the group that gets behind the Yankees at this point have the wherewithal and the interest and the diversity to get the kind of job done that the sports writers, that the fans, that the city and the media uh, in New York deserve. Catfish Hunter's signing at a then unheard of cost, over $3 million, proved Steinbrenner was not afraid to spend. Hiring Billy Martin in 75 proved he was not afraid of controversy. Pride, uh, desire, will to win, self-sacrifice. Uh, these are a lot of little things, but uh, you put them all together and it spells a uh, winner. Restoring Yankee tradition also meant restoring Yankee Stadium. In 76, the renovation was complete. Beautiful looking ball, beautiful ball, ball. Great, great. Now all we need is a winning team. Well, the Yankees got that winning team in the East, but George Brett and the Kansas City Royals won in the West. So it was showdown time in the championship series. In the eighth inning of the fifth game, Brett's three-run homer tied it. But Chris Chambliss in the bottom of the ninth supplied the final pennant winning drama. But the hysteria diminished when Cincinnati swept New York in the World Series. So Mr. Steinbrenner opened his checkbook again. I'm a Yankee because George Steinbrenner was hustling, man, and I, I don't, there's no other way to say it. Uh, and he expressed to me a man-on-man -man relationship, and uh, I feel like I'm a friend of his. I'm a ball player, and I gotta do a job here. But in 77, Billy Martin at times thought Reggie wasn't doing the job. The Yankee skipper also had other problems, and a storm threatened to wreck New York's pennant ship. Billy has 
They had his problems in three different places. For nine innings, you won't find a finer manager in baseball. What I tried to impress upon him in Detroit last week was that if you can put the other qualities with the qualities you have, you'll be one of the greatest managers of all time. And I'm going to insist that he does. George, Billy, and Reggie made plenty of headlines. But in the end, it was winning that headlined the news. Jackson, with 19 game-winning RBIs, enforced his reputation as a pressure player. And a long, arduous struggle with Boston concluded with the Yankees finally winning the American League East by two and a half games. The battle with Kansas City in the championship series was even tougher. Sparky Lyle, New York Cy Young reliever, bailed out a struggling pitching staff in the last two games. In the final game, the Yankees came from behind to rally in the top of the ninth. It was a series in which the Royals held the better cards, only to lose to Yankee professionalism under extreme pressure. New York then went on to beat the Dodgers in the World Series. The next year, free agent Goose Gossage joined the club, and the Yankees looked invincible, especially when Ron Guidry was on the mound. Louisiana Lightning got off to a fast start en route to one of the greatest pitching seasons of all time. Early in the year, it appeared the Yankees might even enjoy life for a change. Changes came, but hardly enjoyable ones. With Boston streaking at a phenomenal pace, New York fell 14 games behind the Sox in mid-July. And there were other troubles now all too familiar. Calm Bob Lemon took over. And although the Yankees soon announced that Billy would return in 1980, this was 78, and Lem still had hope. Every game is important now. We play uh, Boston, then we play uh, uh, Baltimore, and then we play Milwaukee, so they're all important. We're all right there together. But it isn't critical. We have nine games left with uh, Boston, and anything can happen. Anything can happen. That often means it's all over. But in this case, the words were prophetic. The Yankees stormed into contention in August and then blasted Boston to tie for first in early September, wiping out that 14-game deficit. The two clubs then played even to the end, setting up an unforgettable playoff in which Bucky Dent stole the show with his three-run seventh-inning homer. The Yankees won the heartstopper and the most difficult pennant of their incredible history. Greg Nettles then keyed another comeback in the World Series. With the Dodgers up two games to none, Nettles made three run-saving plays in the third game, and New York won four in a row. Where to go after that? Why, straight back to the free agent market, where the Yankees signed pitchers Tommy John and Louis Tion. type of team where you don't need to have a great year out of everybody to, to win. Some teams need to have everybody have a super year to win, and we can just, uh, you know, you could have a couple guys have off years, and we still have enough talent to win. Greg Nettles should have known it's not that simple. Gossage got hurt, and the Yankees fell behind. This time, Bob Lemon was replaced by Billy Martin. 79 held no miracles, but rather tragedy. A void was left behind home plate, which couldn't be filled. Thurman Munson's death in a plane crash made the final year of the decade a sad one indeed at Yankee Stadium. Now, a new decade begins with some new players and a new manager, but the goal's the same. We'll still have Jackson, and we still got Gidry, and uh, we still got Gossage, and we still got Bucky Dent and Willie Randolph, and guys that were here on the championship clubs, Greg Nettles. So uh, you're, every club makes some changes, but this isn't a vastly uh, revised ball club. Basically, this club is intact from the 78 club. Once again, the Yankees have added free agents, such as Bob Watson and key youngsters through trades. It's hard to predict their future, but then when were these Yankees ever predicted? The mid-70s saw a sudden explosion of baseball attendance, and the national pastime was clearly reaffirmed as the number one sport. Americans from 8 to 88 caught the fever. 
the ballpark was the place to go for reasonably priced entertainment. Fans found they could all get into the act. There were demonstrations of the power of artistry. Demonstrations of the power of the occult. And demonstrations of the power of body language. So much to taste and enjoy at the ballpark. Where else do pastures grow so green? Where else so much freedom of madness and motion? In 1976, Comiskey Park catered to the fans like never before. Life at the park was changing everywhere, catching everyone's eye. Max Patkin displayed his classic clown act and found a highly attentive audience. A new breed of mad creatures was quickly hatched, and in the case of the notorious San Diego chicken, rehatched when forced to don a new birthday suit. The chicken got the biggest laughs, but Mr. Philly Fanatic also got his share. In the late 70s, new contenders joined the race for laughs. But it wasn't always easy. Lest we forget, some of the biggest laughs came not at the hands of the jesters, but the players themselves, many of whom saw no reason to be excluded from the field of fun. Certainly on the diamond, there were many times when neither Jack Benny nor Charlie Chaplin could have done it any better, as those who watched This Week in Baseball in the late 70s should well remember. They were baseball's first professional team, and as such, in 1869, the Cincinnati Red Stockings were baseball's only undefeated team. From that point on, baseball had a home in Cincinnati. A century later, the Reds were hailed as the team to watch in the 1970s. 
The entire Cincinnati organization was optimistic as it made plans for the new domain of the Big Red Machine. Old Crosley Field became a flea market for souvenirs of the past. In mid-season 1970, the switch was made. Riverfront Stadium became Cincinnati's Acropolis for the future. That same year, the All-Star Ballot was returned to the fan, and the All-Star Game was played at Riverfront. Pete Rose crashed the party in the bottom of the 12th to score the winning run for the National League. A 22-year-old catcher named Johnny Bench crashed 45 homers, won the MVP award, and led his team to a runaway division victory. And against Pittsburgh in the championship series, the Reds won three straight. Riverfront Stadium was now ready to host its first World Series. But the Baltimore Orioles brought back a familiar face, Frank Robinson, traded four years before from Cincinnati. Frank Robinson combined with Brooks Robinson to demolish Cincinnati pitching in five games. The team of the 70s also lost the series in 72, again falling just short at the finish line. But in 1975, a more mature red machine got into a winning gear that wouldn't be slowed, clinching the earliest title in history. The big names were there. Bench, Rose, Perez, Morgan, and a blossoming George Foster. And to go with all that run production, manages Sparky Anderson's quick hook. A deep and young bullpen featuring left-hander Will McEnany and right-hander Raleigh Eastwick helped the Reds to 108 regular season wins and a three-game sweep in the championship series. If ever the Reds were ready for a world championship, it was now, and the fans really got their money's worth. Cincinnati fought through seven hard games with Boston in the most exciting fall classic of the decade. The 75 series may have done more to promote new interest in baseball than anything else. When Will McEnany delivered the final pitch to Carl Yastrzemski, the Reds had at last won their first World Series in 35 years. A year later at Yankee Stadium, the Reds were back in the series, and Johnny Bench back in his power groove. Cowboy, get, get out of here! Get out of here! Boys, I got news for you. We're going to be world champions again, Sugar Bear. I got news for you. We are now going to be world champions again. With Bench making an impressive comeback from injury, Cincinnati made a clean four-game sweep of the Yankees. Sparky Anderson thought it time for the experts to rate his club among the best of all time. Nineteen seventy-six was the convincing victory Cincinnati so long desired. You are the man for Cincinnati, the baseball capital of the world. Thank you. It seemed like the rare union between this city and this team was unshakable, but time was in fact running out. Tony Perez became the first to go, traded to Montreal. Pete Rose became a free agent. Then the most surprising news came from club president Dick Wagner. The past two years have been good ones by the standards of most teams, but we are determined to set a higher standard. It is our decision that the move we make is in the overall best interest of making the Cincinnati Reds a better team. We feel John McNamara offers outstanding ability and strong major league experience. He's the man to take us in a new direction. John McNamara replaced Sparky Anderson, who had averaged 96 wins per season and Ray Knight replaced Pete Rose at third. Neither were given much chance for success, but both surprised big. Knight hit over 300 and drove in a lot of runs. And behind a staff of promising young arms, McNamara's band of Reds won the National League West. They couldn't beat Pittsburgh for the pennant, but Cincinnati had made a transition for the 1980s. You got to see a different type of team in the 80s compared to in the 70s. We might not possess as much po power as we had in the past, but we're going to have guys hitting for more averages 
and uh, fielding more bases, you're going to feel that fight that we're going to have, the pitching is going to be much stronger. So I just feel that it's going to be a good ball club, but we might not possess as much power as we had in the 70s, but we're still going to be good. So the club hailed as the team of the 70s endured the decade of transition. No one's yet calling this club the team of the 80s, but with the Cincinnati Reds, you never know. No review of the decade of transition would be complete without mentioning two teams that ended it in a manner similar to the way they started it. World champions in 1970, Earl Weaver's Baltimore Orioles met Danny Murtaugh's Pittsburgh Pirates in the 1971 Fall Classic. The Orioles went up two games to none. But Pittsburgh then shut them down, coming back to win in seven. In 1979, Weaver's Orioles met Chuck Tanner's Pirates, but the scenario didn't change. The Birds took a three to one lead in games, but again, the Bucks won in seven. In 71, the late Roberto Clemente starred, while Willie Stargell struggled. But in 79, Stargell led the way. The Pittsburgh success formula was much the same. For example, explosive hitting, the kind represented by Clemente Stargell and recently, Dave Parker. And a strong bullpen. Names like Face and Justy now replaced by Romo, Robinson. And the human scarecrow, Kent Ticalbi. Perhaps most important, the Pirates have gracefully handled the problems of free agents and soaring contracts. So has Earl Weaver, but not so easily. Stars like Frank and Brooks Robinson had him winning at a record pace in the early 70s, as did pitchers like Mike Cuellar, Dave McNally, and gentleman Jim Palmer. Baltimore had four 20-game winners in 71 to go along with its power and tight defense. Later, in the mid-70s, age in the big money market saw many stars leave Baltimore. But in 79, young pitchers like Mike Flanagan and Scott McGregor combined with Palmer again to win with the old formula, pitching, power, and defense. And if Weaver lost too many stars, he countered by using well-chosen utility men, John Lowenstein, who won the first game of the 79 championship series with a 10th inning pinch homer. Baltimore's success proved that a strong organization can win big without great sums of money. But the team that actually won it all was the Pirates. Their method of success may prove to be a model for the 1980s. And what of the new decade? Is Pittsburgh on its way to more pennants? Well, other contenders may have a say about that such as the Montreal Expos, most anxious to greet the new decade. <laughs> After battling Pittsburgh down to the last day of the 79 season, the Expos are still loaded with talent and have added a new star in Ron LaFleur. Meanwhile, Tug McGraw still tells the Philadelphia Phillies, you gotta believe. And he'll get no argument from a near 39-year-old youngster named Rose or a slimmed-down Greg Luzinski. <laughs> Over in the National League West, Joe Morgan rejoins the Houston Astros, while Nolan Ryan adds more fire to baseball's best pitching staff. And what about the Dodgers, three-time division champs in the 70s? Now they've added Dave Goltz and Don Stanhouse to their staff and are looking loose. We'll have some fun this year. We're better. We're all going home. The Kansas City Royals are also looking to bounce back. Clint Hurdle and new first baseman Willie Mays Akins may help them do just that. And over in the American League East, a healthy Larry Heisel could help make Milwaukee unbeatable. Finally, Though the New York Mets don't figure to threaten right away, new ownership brings new hope for the 80s. This ball club has lost 90-some uh, games in the last three years, and uh, they drew uh, less than 800,000 people last year, and that's the, that is the quintessential challenge. 
The Miracle Mets met the quintessential challenge back in 1969. And in the decade that followed, baseball not only met its many challenges, but thrived as never before. The decade witnessed not only transitions in the structure of the game, but also transitions of generations, such as the retirement of Willie Mays, who ended his career right where he began it, in New York City. Within the same decade, Mays was enshrined at Cooperstown, summing up his matchless career in a manner which any true fan of baseball could understand. And in bed last night, I said to myself, how can I write a speech? And I came up with one saying, how can you put it on paper? That's my thing. You cannot do it. The say hey kid was right. Where do you start when the subject is Willie Mays or Carl Yastrzemski? And the 70s? Well, there are simply too many names and moments to cover them all. But some impressions are lasting. Tom Seaver spanned the decade, two Cy Young Awards, and still going strong. The 70s saw other pitching greats end their careers. A tip of the hat to Gibson, Drysdale, Wilhelm, and Marischal. The decade also belonged to Rod Carew, six batting titles in seven years. And who will ever forget K-Line, the Robinsons, Aparicio, and Killebrew? These men proved the impossible merely improbable, and the improbable quite possible. And baseball, well, from 1970 through 79, baseball grew in popularity like never before. Now we step into the 80s, but the 1970s will always be a part of history, the decade of transitions.